Hello, Leanne Faraday Brash here, and it's my absolute pleasure to bring you today the next instalment in our Outstanding Leader series for Brash Consulting. It's my pleasure to introduce and to have a chat with the Chief Executive Officer of HESTA, Debbie Blakey. Debbie, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Leanne. It's lovely to be here with you. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, if we start at the very beginning, or not quite at the beginning, you went to university in South Africa and did your undergraduate there, and then began running your own consultancy and combining that with a young family. Mm. Okay. Mm. I know that that can be quite challenging because I've done it myself. If you look back at those times, how did you try to master work-life integration? And do you think it would be any different for women doing that now? Oh, that's a great question. And look, it, it was a challenge, I guess, in some ways. And yet at the same time, I feel it really just unfolded. So I had, straight after uni, I'd worked for firstly a large life office and then some consulting actuaries and had very formal you know, work hours, very formal work environment, never worked from home, that sort of um, work life. And after I had my children, I actually took a few years off. I did a lot of study and had a few years at home. And when I thought of going back into that very formal environment, I realised it really didn't fit with the kind of mother I wanted to be and the availability I wanted to have. And that was really one of the reasons why I decided to launch my own business and do my own consulting. And, you know, sometimes I laugh because if you think that that's going to be easier than formal hours, I think that's a bit naive. So it certainly was very intense at times, but it gave me flexibility around when I was on and when I wasn't. And, you know, I think I developed some habits which actually have possibly become a bit lifelong habits, a lot of evening work. Um, but, you know, you do what you, you need to do to juggle and to do it the way you want to do it. And I think that's really important for women. It's one thing I always say to young women, do it the way you want to do it. Don't feel you have to do it the way others do it or work within certain requirements. Work out what works for you. Mm -hmm. There's no paint by numbers way of doing everything. Absolutely okay. not, no. Okay. Uh, you then immigrated to Australia and to our good fortune and worked for six years with a small superannuation firm, is that right? Yes. Then a brief stint at a professional services firm and I don't know whether or not you realise this, but we could almost have met each other at oh. that point because they were a client of mine at the time you were there, I worked out. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yes. Interesting. And then you went to Hester. Mm. Yes. 2008 uh, as the executive member services. Yes. Okay. If you look back on the organisation then that you were to come to lead eventually, what was it about the organisation that excited you back then and in what way is that different to how the organisation is placed now? The main thing that excited me was, I think, the authenticity of the organisation of HESTA. I had, interestingly, when I worked for the other fund, we often got together as a number of industry super funds and did professional development together. Happened to often ha occur in the HESTA boardroom. So it was really interesting. I'd been in the kitchen and made myself a cup of tea and I'd been in the boardroom and I'd kind of been exposed to it and it always stood out to me as a fund that I would love to work at. And part of that was the organisation. Another part of that was actually the CEO, just an amazingly strong female leader who I felt I could learn so much from. And, you know, coming into the organisation, I think for me what was so interesting is I always wondered if what I saw from the outside was the same as what was inside. And in fact, I asked the CEO as part of the interview process, I actually asked her that and I said, is it the same or am I going to get into the organisation and realise some of that is a shell or a mask? And she said, no, it absolutely is consistent. And if it isn't, you know, I want to know. So if you ever see anything that's not consistent, I want to know. And I think for me, that's a big part of what we had and what I would never, ever want to lose. There is a, a very deep authenticity. If we say it, we do it. If we don't do it, we don't want to say it. So that's incredibly important to me. But it's evolved as an organisation. You know, we are different. Ten years later, every organisation changes. And if we hadn't changed, I think that would be a very sad thing because you have to evolve and change to kind of retain that leading edge. So we have changed, but there's some deep cultural things that I hope don't change. Mm. Okay. Uh, You've mentioned Anne-Marie Corboy and coming to work in her organisation. Who are the, the women trailblazers who have helped shape 
your leadership ethos and indeed who are some of the men and what are the principles that you actually learnt from those people. Perhaps even less than the names themselves is more the learnings that you had as you were taking your leadership journey and becoming the, the values-based leader that I really believe you are. Mm. There are actually a lot. And, you know, some big contributors. Anne-Marie is obviously a very big contributor. She mentored me in many ways. I was deputy CEO under her for three and a half years and she built a lot of confidence in me and she really backed me. And so she was a really big part of that. But there are actually a lot across my journey and some in very small areas, some who pushed me a little bit to the edge of what I was comfortable with, which looking back, I think I needed, I needed to have that. Um, one of them is actually a client, one of my early clients when I went on my own and launched my own business and just a very strong belief in me and a, a very strong belief that I could do this and I could operate in what was a, essentially a very male environment. And, you know, John used to just call me out. I would be in their organisation, I'd be doing training or I'd be doing something specific um, related to the business that I did with them and he would just stop and he would ask me a few questions and almost pierce right into my heart and I I think those are really important role models to have and, and also lovely it's not just about women mm -hmm. inspiring other women it's really important to have those men in our life as well. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the hallmarks of a person who is fundamentally humble is that sometimes other people see things in you that you don't necessarily see in yourself as early as they might uh, and I remember one time a chief executive saying to me, my golden rule is that if I feel a little bit excited but also a little bit nervous, I know I should do it. Yes, yes. yes. Actually, I think, Leanne, that's an amazing, I've really operated like that. And I expect that of my team. You know, you've got to, you've got to have a little bit of discomfort. If you ever feel completely comfortable, you, you're not challenging yourself enough, but clearly you're not being challenged enough. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you, just that little bit of, butterflies of, you know, am I going to be able to do this is actually really healthy. Can you isolate, because I know you're a very intentional leader, some of those principles that you probably carry with yourself every day, some of them quite consciously and deliberately, and we'll talk about them. So you'll be explicit about them. But maybe some of those things intrinsic to you that probably other people see in you uh, and I've done a little bit of research and I'll tell you about that later, but that other people see you embodying every day. What would be some of those life principles and, uh, that reflect your leadership ethos? Probably the most important one for me is that people really matter. And, you know, I think it's easy at times. I, I've worked in very technical environments. Easy to be distracted by the specialist focus we have, the tasks we do, the job we do. And I don't care what your job is. I think people really matter. And for me, obviously, that's been a big part of my journey and, and very much in leadership. As I've become a more senior leader, I think a realisation that people matter more and more and more. And um, we're investing in that, that thinking around our people. You know, we talk about our culture and you've worked with us and done some lovely work on culture. But our people and our culture being our main competitive advantage. And that's not something we just say. It's something I really, really understand. Every one of those people in our organisation, the opportunity we have to really invest in them and make sure that we're getting the best out of them. Um, one of the challenges for executive leaders is that they can become, if you like, prisoners of their own elevation. How do you balance trying to be attuned to what's going on in, inside your organisation and particularly with your people while you're busy managing so much in terms of external context and other very senior mm. stakeholders? That's a great question. And, you know, that's actually a challenge. And I, I think you're right. I don't think it's only CEOs, but any leader, you know, you, you can end up in a little bit of a vacuum. You only get the good news. No one really wants to come and give you the bad news. Everyone nods when you suggest something around the table. Everyone nods and, you know, that's a great idea, even if they don't think it's a great idea. So I think you've got to create um, feedback loops. For me, that's been really important. And actually, sometimes I'm more successful than other times. I recognise that there are times when I'm very busy, when I'm not investing in those feedback loops enough. And so I have people in my organisation at all different levels who I have actually tapped on the shoulder and said, I want you to give me feedback. I want you to give me when you see something happening or you think I could do something better or you question something, 
I'm, I'm asking you. I'm not empowering you to do it. I'm actually asking you, making it part of your responsibility. Because it, it can be. I think you can live in that bubble. And, you know, you're sometimes just not close enough to what's really going on. So you've got to make sure you're always creating that loop. Do you find that there are some people in the organisation uh, that are not sure they can take you at your word, that they're really reluctant to step up to the plate and tell you anything other than that which they think you want to hear? Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, I think it's often people who are newer to the organisation. They've just got to establish their confidence that that's really what we want. And it takes time. But I find it amazing and it's often really sort of in the business that you'll just find people who are happy to give feedback. And I'm not talking about just being negative. I'm not talking about people who are just looking to, you know, knock every dis discussion and be the negative voice. I'm looking for people who genuinely understand how to navigate through that and, you know, give, give positive feedback, but give that slight criticism of what we could do better so that we're challenging ourselves. But definitely there's some people who get it and some people who don't. I think culturally, some people are, are not as comfortable giving um, that sort of feedback. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't surprise me that it may take some people a while to realise that you're fair dinkum about that because depending upon where they've come from, that may not have been allowed or it may have been explicitly supported, but in actuality, when people gave feedback that someone didn't want to hear, it was as if they it cost them something in, in some way. So taking some time and doing that and realise that you really are true to your word and that you will you will welcome it, you know, as opposed to punish it uh, is really important. And I think it speaks to the, the genuine value of consistency in action and not just what we talk about as a leader. Uh, the um, gender pay gap has received a lot of publicity over the last couple of years and particularly in the advent of this current revolution we're all living through with the Me Too movement. But the gender gap in relation to superannuation is, is actually far worse. Uh, I know that's something you're passionate about. Uh, how do we try to transcend that gap when there are so many direct and indirect barriers to women uh, being able to retire with dignity? Well, I, you know, for us, the first contributor to the gender gap in retirement is the gender gap in employment, gender gap in remuneration and gender gap in opportunities. So we see the biggest contribution we can make to closing that is in having strong advocacy around gender diversity. And, you know, we do that. So the companies that we invest in we expect to see good diversity at the board and at management and right through the organisation because that's going to be the most important way we can address that. Having said that, that's almost about the future. And, you know, we, we do. We have a very loud voice on that and we believe we have a very important role to play. But I think there is, there is the other side of just being realists and saying right now women do often dominate the caring positions. If you look at a fund like Hester, you know, we're in the health and community mm -hmm. services sector, childcare, aged care. Over 80% of our members are women because those are the roles that women historically have been drawn to. And those roles are often not remunerated as much as some other roles, which is another whole issue. I mean, we could talk about that. What are the roles we really value as society? But so, you know, we're very aware there are things that can be done around paying super on parental leave, paid parental leave as well as unpaid parental leave, and looking at system settings that we can do to try and address that gap in retirement. It's a real issue for us as a country. A little provocation in relation to that. There will be some men and certainly some women who will say, it is actually my choice to choose to stay at home, mm -hmm. to raise children and to have career breaks, some of which may be career breaks of quiet a length. Why should any organisation or why should a country compensate us for our free choice to have children and to take breaks away from work? What would you say to that? You know, in an ideal situation, I think to empower people to make the choices they make and to, in a sense, live with the consequence of those sounds perfect. The reality is that single women in the later years of their life are very vulnerable. They're very vulnerable to poverty. They're the fastest growing group of homeless in Australia. We have to deal with this. So, you know, to, to have that sort of broad attitude of we make the choices we make and we live with them, we, we end up with a society that's not taking care of people who are very, very vulnerable.
So I think it's both. And, you know, I do support women. I, we as an organisation want to strongly support women to make the choices they make around career breaks, around working part time. We want to create an environment where women have that flexibility. But I think we can also look at policy settings that mean we have better diversity and equality between men and women in terms of retirement benefit. I think you've almost answered this question with some of the things you've said, but there's no doubt to me that some CEOs appear to have a laser-like focus on shareholder return and they really see the purview of their roles as really looking out for, if you like, the profitability of the organisation. Uh, in having the privilege of chatting with Susan Alberti last year, she talked in really glowing terms about Gillan McLaughlin and what he did to advance the establishment of AFLW. And you can see all the ripple benefits for women, not just women in sport, but women and girls in general, in looking at something like that, um, because he's actually cast the net wider and he's, he sees his role in terms of sphere of influence as being bigger than simply ensuring that, you know, Aussie rules footy flourishes in this country. It seems as if you've also made a decision to leverage mm -hmm. the stature of your role to have a loud voice on a lot of the issues that go, strictly speaking, beyond your own membership uh, and the benefits to those members? We absolutely do, uh, Leanne. You know, we talk a lot about the opportunity we have where we are making a difference to people's financial future in terms of the actual dollars they'll have in their account. And, you know, returns are a huge determinant of that. We really understand the power of excellent investment returns and seek that from the organisations we invest in. But there's a parallel issue of the world that our members will retire into. And, you know, what is the economy? What is the environment? What is the society our members will retire into? and understanding our opportunity of influence broadly in that. And, you know, if our members, if we're doing everything we can to build their retirement savings, but they're retiring into a world that's ravaged by climate change, mm -hmm. we feel we've missed an opportunity because we do have that broad opportunity to influence and we, we actually believe it's part of our responsibility as stewards of our members' money. And the fantastic thing actually about HESTA is our members expect us to do that. We've done research recently on our brand health in terms of engaging with members and what do they expect of the HESTA brand? What is, what is their expectation of us as an organisation? And it's really interesting because our members expect us to be taking into account of environmental impacts of decisions we make or the social impacts of decisions. So it's wonderful. We just feel this very strong alignment where it's what's on our heart but the fact that we've got the mandate from our members to do it is absolutely huge for us. You've talked about the context in which your members may retire into. We've just, we're just having the last conversations around the Banking Royal Commission. At this present moment, there's debate at federal level about whether or not a National Integrity Commission should be established. What else do you have to make sure that you're ahead of the game on? One of the things that has come out quite strongly from the Royal Commission is this idea of consumer expectation. And, you, you know, I think this is very powerful for us as a country, mm -hmm. that it's not just about meeting your regulatory obligations. It's not just about doing what's legal. It's actually having that extra lens about what would your customers expect? What would consumers expect of an organisation like HESTA or an organisation like a bank? And I think that's going to give us very rich dialogue. And personally, I'm, I get nervous about too much additional regulation. You know, the regulatory framework doesn't always help us because people then just tick the regulatory boxes. And I think what's really needed is this discussion about doing the right thing, doing the right things for society, doing the right thing for your customers. It's not just about meeting legal obligations. It's much higher and much broader than that. So we certainly see, I think that dialogue is going to continue. And, you know, it'll probably continue with regulators. I mean, those are the things that regulators should be asking of organisations. ASIC should be asking those questions. If you're an organisation to protect consumers, you should be thinking about, well, what are the consumer expectations? What do they consider as right in this situation? Yes, and I've seen that consulting in my space as well, that organisations are setting 
if you like, their um, raison d'etre as being not only financial and not only legal, but moral, ethical, uh, and wanting to actually demonstrate that, that they are an organisation with character. Um, you know, even in the, the last bastion of machismo in AFL football, there are senior coaches in football who are saying, we want people to come into our organisation and leave our organisation as better human beings. Mm. Uh, and I don't think we'll ever pull back from that. I can't really foresee a time, and I'm not sure that you do, where the only thing that will matter is sort of the bare minimum from a governance or a or a compliance point of view, and certainly not in a world of social media, oh, where we are only one tweet away from uh, from brand disaster um, and the need for what I call scandal handle. Uh, <laughs> I have a question um, in relation to, I guess, uh, trust and uh, and brand awareness, but more so in relation to you and your organisation. Uh, you said that obviously the organisation enjoys very high trust. Um, you listen to your members and your members feel as if they can tell you what is important to them. But I did do a little bit of research about what some people actually think of you as their leader. And I'd like to share a few of these things with you. Um, one word that was used was that you're an amazing leader, that you're always supportive and grateful uh, you're constantly striving to drive outcomes that benefit members, which you've talked about. Another thing is your ability to cut through, make decisions without unnecessary bureaucracy and that you uh, have a great strategic radar. Beyond that, you're smart, charming and funny, and I've certainly seen that in you. But I wanted to ask you about that strategic radar. In light of all the things that uh, are happening at the moment, and I mentioned some of those before, the Banking Royal Commission, the call for an integrity commission, what would be the sorts of things that you're going to be forced potentially to come to terms with and to manage that you may not have necessarily envisaged 10 years ago when you joined the organisation? But part of that I just, I think, is the increasing complexity. Our businesses used to be relatively simple. And, you know, they're not. And part of it is the disruption that's happening. This new age, you know, social media, the digital disruption, the expectations of our members are enormously different to what they were 10 years ago. So I think some of it will be brought on by regulatory change, regulatory scrutiny. But I think a lot of it is actually driven by just general disruption, where, where the world is just changing and shifting. Um, you know, we even talk about some of our partners, some of our service providers who have been such a core part of what we've delivered to our members. They've got to evolve with us. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, battle to continue to deliver like that. So I, I think those are the biggest challenges that we face as an organisation. And, you know, also the, the expectations within our workplace of wanting to deliver a fantastic experience to every employee. And I think employees have a different expectation to what they used to have. And I actually love that. Nobody just comes to work and wants to do a job mm -hmm. and sort of nine to five and then I go home and moan about how tough my day was and come back in tomorrow and do it again. Nobody wants that. And I love the fact that our people don't want that. I love the fact that they have an expectation of, you know, inspire me, challenge me, you know, give me amazing work, give me amazing purpose, make it clear to me why. Everything I do, I want to know why I'm doing it. And I love that we're being challenged on that. But obviously it, it puts pressure on the organisation to continue to evolve and to make sure that we're meeting that challenge. Okay, we started with you and I'd like to finish with you. Uh, you really seem to me to be a leader that is able to hold yourself in role under immense pressure. And early in our conversation, you spoke about those people who seem to have that trust and confidence in you that you may at times not have had in your in yourself, those flickering moments of doubt. Do you still have any of those moments and, and what are the things, if you're willing to share them, that somehow trigger those moments of, of doubt until you sort yourself out again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Leanne, I think we all have those. And, you know, I think if you get to a day when you don't have those at all, I, I actually, I'd be a bit concerned if I ever got to that because I'd be worried that there was some sort of arrogance or overconfidence. But so I absolutely do have them. You know, what triggers them? Um, for me, it's probably when I really have very limited capacity to prepare for things that in my ideal world I would have prepared for. I, I actually think that's one of the biggest challenges of being a CEO. 
you know, previously, if I had certain engagements, I would always be able to book out time and prepare for them, be they internal, external, a little bit of research, and everything sort of flowed well. I don't have that anymore. I'm often running from, you know, A to B with very little downtime between engagements. And I think that that's for me when I have a, can I do this? It's when I feel rushed and sort of crowded. But, you know, you do have those moments. You have those big moments when you're wanting to influence something, you're wanting to get a particular outcome. You know, that when you have clarity in terms of how you see something and others possibly don't, and you have that moment of thinking, well, is it just me? Am I missing something? What are they all seeing that I'm not seeing? Um, but so we, I definitely do have them. And, you know, for me, I often do go back to um, go back to earlier times, just reflect back, yeah, I felt this before, this is when I felt it, this was the outcome. You know, it, you, you just sort of have to push through it. Mm-hmm. We talk a little bit actually at Hester about going through. You know, there's, there are times, we had some times this year, we've had a very busy agenda this year, mm-hmm. and there are times that you almost feel it's like a big wave and you just have to go through it. You can't turn around and, and get out of the way, you just have to go through it. And I... I think as leaders, you know, we have those times when you just know you just have to do it. You have to sort of put on the armor and, you know, feel as strong as you possibly can and you just have to go through it. And when you come out the other end, you've got, you know, new additions in your tool set of something else that you've dealt with, something else that you've coped with. And I think we're just always building that, all of us as leaders. What is the hardest thing you have to do? What do you have the most difficulty with? What might keep you up at night or, or feel so intensely uncomfortable that you actually wonder whether or not it's, it's right? For me, that's definitely around the people management. Uh, you know, you, you want to really make sure you're making the right decisions in terms of the people that you have in your organisation. And for me, the ones that I agonise over are when you know that you maybe not you know, you're not giving somebody what they wanted. I mean, I've I've got a recent example of, you know, somebody seeking an internal promotion and the most delightful, delightful person. And I would love to meet her expectations, but knowing it's not the right thing for the organisation and actually being able to make that tough decision. The easy decision is to say, well, you know, it'll sort of be okay, but being able to make the tough decision of saying that's, That's not the right thing for her or for the organisation and actually holding to that. Those are the ones that I think are always quite difficult. Strategically, there are some big decisions that we make. You know, we take, in our organisation, we're making decisions where we're taking risk. We're taking investment risk or, you know, we're taking on certain risk with respect to our digital expansion. And... You know, those are, those are big decisions, but I think they're decisions you can inform with a lot of information and eventually be quite satisfied that you're making the right decision. The ones that impact people are, are more difficult. Mm. You, you talk about having to sometimes push through when things are difficult. We also talked about the fact that there is no one right paint-by-numbers way to juggle work and life and some of us may choose to work nights and weekends and it actually works for us because it alleviates the pressure and allows us to prepare in the way you would like to be able to prepare but how do you know and i ask this of lots of leaders how do you know when you are sailing close to the wind what what happens for you that leads you to believe that you're just on the edge of from coping to not coping Mm -hmm. and what do you do to draw on your resilience? What do you do to relax, to turn off, or to bring yourself back when you are um, close to the wind? Interestingly, when I came into the CEO role at Hester, I spent a lot of time exploring the why. Why did I actually want the job? Um, you know, it's very, I've been deputy CEO, you can almost say, well, of course you want to be CEO, but I spent time working with a coach and working through why. And for me, when I feel a little bit tired and possibly a little bit of stressed, for me, it's just such a great time to just slow it down and to just think about the why. And I force myself to do that. I'll force myself on a flight somewhere. Instead of working madly on the emails, just take 20 minutes and close my eyes and just think again about the why. Why are we doing what we're doing at Hester? Why am I doing what I'm doing at Hester? And I feel that, find that the most energising thing to do. It's, it's amazing how 
you know, energy builds, I think, from that clarity um, of purpose. So for me, that's very big. Okay, and I think being the woman you are and hearing the way people talk about you, I really knew that you weren't going to tell me that you wanted to be the CEO because you wanted to be the CEO. <laughs> Can I thank you so much, Debbie, for chatting with me? Oh, thank you, Leanne. Thank you for the opportunity.